Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Well, welcome to Meet the Author. My name Today we're going to be speaking to, with Edmund Sherman. He's the author of this new book, Contemplative Aging, A Way of Being in Later Life. Um, Edmund was from the U of Albany. He's now retired. He was part of the School of Social Welfare. And he's taught courses in the graduate level on um, aging, human development. He's done a lot of research in gerontolo gerontology. He's also a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, and he's written other books, including Counseling the Aging, Working with Older Persons, Meaning in Midlife Transitions, and Reminisce and the Self in Old Age. So welcome, Edmund. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, well, before we start talking about specifically about the book, just give us the short capsule. I always like to ask people the short capsule biography of of yourself, if you can sum it up in a... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and all you've done, you know, in your, in your career. Sure. Before we talk uh, about the book. Well, kind of a <clears throat> quick resume. Uh, I was born and raised in Buffalo and uh, went to Buffalo Public Schools. Um, when I was in high school, the Second World War was on. <clears throat> and uh, like all the young men at that time, I was eager to get into it. Um, and I wasn't doing well at school, not at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was pretty much of a dropout because I joined the Navy when I was 17 and uh, went to, but that was in 1945, so the war was pretty well over. And um, I didn't see any action, although I was at the bikini bomb tests, were, which were a okay. big thing at that time. At any rate, uh, as I was being mustered out of the Navy, by the way, any thoughts I had about higher education or anything were absolutely zilch. I figured I'd work with my hands the rest of my life. You didn't foresee yourself as a as academic a professor. Okay. No, no way, <laughs> no way whatsoever. Uh, at any rate, uh, when I was waiting to be mustered out in San Francisco, uh, out in uh, an island there, Treasure Island they called it, uh, I had no money, nothing much else to do, and, I had, and we had to spend about three weeks being what they called mustering out with all the paperwork yeah. and stuff. And the only thing I could do was go to the library and read. And I read, and I read, and I read, and I read, and started reading one thing after another. And pretty soon, I thought, hey, this is not bad. I wouldn't mind going on in school and reading some more. So I went with the GI Bill of Rights. I uh, went to a very quick high school uh, thing. They, they called, actually called it Veterans High School. Had you graduated? I had not graduated. Oh, okay. I left in my, the okay. beginning of my senior year. And I, was, I would have dropped out. I was okay. flunking everything. At any rate. <laughs> Uh, so when I got back, they had this veterans high school, so it was accelerated, and I was able to get through in one semester, and then I went to college from there. Uh, at that time, there was a college they had associated up upstate New York, and it was called Sampson College. It used to be a naval base in the Second World War, at, in the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Seneca, uh, Finger Lake, sorry. At any rate, from there I transferred to the University of Buffalo. At that time, that was a private university, uh, later became part of the State so, University okay. of New York. But at any rate, uh, I went there, I got a bachelor's degree in modern European history, then uh, worked for a couple of years as a social worker, uh, case worker for the Department of Public Welfare in Erie County, and then uh, started taking master courses in social work and got a master's oh, really? social work degree. Then after that, um, I went on to um, Poughkeepsie, New York, at the old Hudson River State Hospital yeah. as a psychiatric social sure, worker. Sure, sure. And then in the process of doing psychiatric social work, I wanted to be able to get involved in community planning for mental health. And I needed a doctorate for that. And they had a program in community mental health at Bryn Mawr College which is a women's college, but at the graduate level, after the Second World War, they, uh, men they enrolled men, men. 
So I got the PhD at Bryn Mawr, but in the process of getting it, I became a teaching assistant, and then an instructor, and then an assistant professor oh. there. And uh, from there, I, I then moved to Hunter College, uh, where I taught courses in um, uh, what they call human behavior and development, uh, social work practice research, social work research, and uh, then uh, transferred from, uh, no, then I worked as a, a research associate at Child Welfare League of America, and after a few years I came to the University of Albany and I was there for 22 years. Wow. Well, I can't <coughs> help but asking, to go back to the beginning because this is fascinating to me, what did you read in those three weeks <laughs> that but made you, I mean, if, can you remember I, anything? Be honest? If that three week period, if that three week period spurred you on, I mean, I gotta just tell people watching, this book is amazingly sort of scholarly and learned and the bibliography is huge and you're obviously an unbelievably well-read person. Uh -huh. What do you, do you remember anything yeah, about that three totally week? honest about it? Yeah. I, okay. I was, you were, I was, you were just I was only a 19-year-old. But you were okay, just reading. So what was my mind on? Yeah. Uh, uh, have you heard of Erskine Caldwell? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. God's Little Laker. Well, God's Little Laker, absolutely. <laughs> that, was it. That, that was the hot thing to read when you were a young man, right? Especially yeah. in the Navy. So I started reading Erskine Caldwell. Okay. The thing is, Erskine Caldwell had substance. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he, of course, would make references <laughs> at various times to other writers, and then I'd start reading them. Okay. And then everything started spreading out. And, All right. uh, well, that's how I read as a young. I read a lot, too. And you read something, and it, it either spurs you on to that same author's, like my first big love was Mark Twain. I read Mark Twain. Then all of a sudden, oh, yeah. I read everything about Mark Twain. But then, of course, you read more. They all they all become branches to other, you know, a book like your exactly. book, this book here that we're talking about today, Contemplative Aging. You mentioned James Hillman and um, Carl Jung and Alan Watts. It makes you want to go read those books. Mm -hmm. Many of them I've heard of. Yeah. Well, why don't we talk about we'll talk about your book now, Contemplative Aging, a way of being in later life. Um, what are I guess this may be a good place to start. What do you see as some of the trends in aging? In 2011 in America, I mean, I, obviously the aging, our, our conceptions of aging, our perceptions of aging, and attitudes toward death have really changed, would you say, in the last 50 years, or have they always been in flux? I don't know. <laughs> what can you yeah, say about the current I, I state? think so. Yes, I think so. I think there's been a, um, there's been a shift in emphasis. I, I would have to say there's kind of a popular imperative at this point, and it probably comes out of... Uh, the baby boom, which is mm. emerging now as the largest uh, cohort of uh, elders uh, arriving soon on the scene or already getting there. And uh, there seems to be a kind of popular imperative to stay active, keep going, mm -hmm. don't let down, just keep going until you drop, basically, the but idea. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of literature on how it, you can stay younger mm -hmm. longer and not really get old, which of course is a pretty impossible task. <laughs> uh, and, but it, it's there, it's very powerful. And there's also, even in the professional field of gerontology, there's a kind of bias toward middle age, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a tendency to sort of see things where you are. Now, I did most of my research when I was in my middle years and most other gerontologists do also. And uh, there's a tendency to sort of think this is the way I would want yeah. to age out, right? Except we don't all have that choice. And sooner or later, we're going to lose physical capacities, mental capacities, and so on, and we have to be, in a sense, do we have any preparation for that? And all of the emphasis, it seems to me, on staying active, mm -hmm. being active, especially physically, um, overlooks or ignores the, uh, the issues of mind and spirit, if you will, that will be necessary in your very latest years. Well, your book, your book here is very philosophical and spiritual, I guess I could use that word. Um, and you're right, I know when, you, when you think of, when you think of um, retirement, say, all the commercials or all the whatever, mm -hmm. all the TV shows and 60 Minutes and everything, what do you hear about when you see retirement? 401k and your grandkids and travel and travel now your book golf, and it seems golf. like your book is specifically geared toward the philosophical 
the contemplative, men, right? Contemplative, the reflective, course, contemplative, the aging. reflective, so. the reflective attitude. But this is not usually mentioned in our conception or in the popular press or whatever. Of that's right. Uh, do you, has it been and forgotten, that, or why do you think it's why do you think it's not been emphasized? Uh, I think because of um, the current emphasis on. Um, being well, being healthy, being engaged, uh, which is probably characteristic of the boomer generation. Yeah. May not be of this coming generation, but <laughs> certainly among the boomers, there's a, 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 a zest and so on. They want to carry on. I, it's, it's hard to uh, figure, but then also medical advances. Mm -hmm. You're seeing people living into their 80s and 90s and, and you know, centenarians. Uh, much more common when you look at obituaries. So I think that a lot of that affects our okay. overall attitude. Well, your book, your, your book tries to um, make this difference, I guess you'd say, between you're calling contemplative aging. Um, it's not a continuation of midlife, doing the same. It's, it's, a, whole right. other, it's a whole other place. I guess, are you saying right. maybe the boomers or who the, currently we just want old age or whatever to be a continuation in midlife? And well, you're that, saying it's, it should be something different. Yeah, well, a lot of, uh, I, I think that's, again, the popular notion, and to some extent, some professionals feel the same way, especially in the medical field, geriatrics. But um, if, if the, to get at this business of the gero trend, uh, okay, transcendence that's idea, if you just say uh, that again did, for people watching, what's the, the term again? The term is gero transcendence, okay. G-E-R-O -E trans for age, of course, and okay. then transcending. Okay, gero uh, transcendence. Transcending, in a sense, the issues of aging okay. that we see as problems. Uh, there did massive studies in Scandinavia, a, a Swedish sociologist by the name of Lars Tornström, and literally thousands of people in Denmark, Sweden, and so on that they interviewed. And they, uh, and they came up with the fact that this is, based on this, uh, going into old age is truly a different developmental stage. And it has characteristics and qualities of its own, different from middle age, mm -hmm. different from adolescence, different from young adulthood, all of that. And those things had to do with, um, he even had the subtitle for general transcendence, uh, the contemplative dimension of aging. Not, and you make a big point in your book, not loneliness. Not, not loneliness, right. Or despair is, or whatever. Right, no, but, it's, but but it's a matter of fact, one of the things that they find, that they study with psychological tests uh, and uh, interviews and questionnaires and so on, was a thing they call interiority of the personality. As a person gets older, into their 60s most notably, there's a, a, a kind of a, a turn inward, a more reflective mm -hmm. attitude, sort of trying to figure out what's it all been about. And um, as a matter of fact, they feel more comfortable with it if they're allowed to, if they're in a situation where they have to feel yeah. they have to be socially engaged and can't, in a sense, contemplate anything, well, then they can't. But there is a tendency toward that, and it shows up across the board. Now, there was some question in the field of gerontology about his findings, because uh, this is running somewhat counter to this business of you know mm -hmm. staying active, socially engaged, and so on, because now you're talking about things like contemplation and uh, solitude frequently. Instead of loneliness, solitude is different than loneliness. And you also, I just I mean interrupt you, but you also make a point along with that in your book about less, less em more emphasis on, you know, not, not being concerned with the trivialities of, you know, don't go to a social function if it's just... Yes, no. right. So they call us super. No, there's less engagement in superficial yes, social. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The superficial. So no, good friendships absolutely remain, yeah. but it's the more superficial ones that were more or less required of you when you were working. So these studies are showing a movement toward what were you, toward um, toward this more reflective interior mm -hmm. uh, kind of life, uh, where people, in fact, sort of go through what's called a life review. Uh, they reminisce a great deal. One of the reasons they you find older people talking about the old times is they're really working things through, mm -hmm. even though they're aware of it or not themselves. Uh, trying to put things in place. How did it all fit? How did they? Well, you're, you know, one of your little um, book reviews here, the book is getting really good reviews, I should say, and there's a little interview with you here. <coughs> a part of this, maybe this, 
it's not, um, yeah, I guess when you're younger, you ask yourself, what is the meaning of life? But you're saying at this point, what has been the in, meaning in of life? In a sense, life? right. Yes. And, and thinking all the this. life, in fact, that I've most, for the most part, led. And, uh, you know, yeah. how does it look? And it turns out that a number of things, if I can uh, sort of repeat sure, them from sure. here. Uh, the, fi the findings from the Gerald Transcendence things is first, you know, this greater satisfaction with the inner life, okay? This um, interiority thing I mentioned. There's also a redefinition of the, the, the position of life and death. And as a matter of fact, there's an empirical finding that there's a decreased fear of death among those who have high ratings on this Gerald Transcendence mm -hmm. uh, scale. Third thing is there's kind of a redefinition of time, space, and objects. Uh, just to pick up on the objects, because you're slowing down, because you're not going as fast, you see things that might have been considered mundane. You'd overlook yeah. minor things that suddenly, well, now, not suddenly, but they, eventually start paying attention to or they can, in a way they can, that they can is can very overwhelm different. you, I think, sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> right. You become, in a sense, more attentive. and. Uh, it, but it's a slower process mm -hmm. of really looking at things that you hadn't looked at before. Yeah. You know, you pick up a glass of water and you drink it rapidly because you want to get onto something else. This time you might just take a look <laughs> at the water and how it reflects, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, another thing is, uh, a, a, as I said, a decreased interest in su superficial social interaction. There's also a decreased interest in, in material things, uh, the money and mm -hmm. uh, the clothing. And in fact, uh, what happens is when people get beyond 60, the amount of money they spend on clothing and all of those things yeah. drops astronomically. <laughs> um, there's a, de a decrease in self-centeredness. By that, I mean any measures of egotism mm -hmm. and so on. There's a tendency to be less of that because Older people generally have found where their flaws are as well as their uh, good things. Oh, yeah. And they've put all those things together. And there's, uh, as he said, they spend more time in meditation. That's in quotes, meditation. Meaning that it could be anything uh, that where they might just stop in the middle of something that they're doing and become reflective. Uh, but on the other hand, for example, I was very much taken by Eric Fromm's work where he his last book, which was published uh, posthumously called um, The Art of Being, okay. um, he said the, the art of being, the first thing that one has to do in a sense is to meditate. And in his instance, he picked up on what's called mindfulness meditation which is very current now. You've probably heard about it. Oh yeah. John Kabat-Zinn sure. who yep, uses yep. it. And there, what's that? His book was called "Wherever You Are, There yeah, You Are." Yeah. Or Wherever like you go, there you are. Wherever yeah. you go, there you are. That's yeah. Right. Well, your exactly. book is, has very. It sounds very influenced by um, Eastern philosophy. Yes, right. Okay. Uh, mindfulness meditation comes out of, I think, Buddhist practices mm -hmm. for the most part, but Westerners have taken it up a uh, well, great in, deal. It, well, yeah. Why don't you talk about that? Because in your book, you mention um, there's different ways. To meditate, not just sitting in a. Oh, yes, right. You have this mindfulness. You you you've written d down here different things, walking a personal um, a personal keeping a personal journal. Absolutely. Very important aspect was reading, mm -hmm. um, movement, um, doing some kind of art, mm -hmm. something like in gardening you can be contemplating. Absolutely. Very so these important. all come under the mindfulness. What um, mm -hmm. you talk and your book. I should tell people watching the book goes into. It's not really a how to, but you do give ways to maybe achieve some of this. Yeah, Why don't you talk about, talk, yeah, keep, keep talking about this mindfulness stuff. We probably need more of that in our, <laughs> in our country now. Well, yeah. Um, the journal writing, for example, I think this tends to become more, uh, uh, people tend to take more interest in memoirs. You're seeing more memoirs. Oh, that's the whole, so on. half the biographies now that come out Absolutely. are memoirs, really. Right. And um, so that, uh, I was particularly interested by Ira Progoff's um, a journal method, which he had workshops all okay. over the place, uh, where you go through a series of things, and, pa and part of it involves meditation, what he calls process meditation, where you really have to slow the mind down, mm -hmm. allow things to sort of come up, and then write them down. The process of writing down what you're 
reflecting on and allowing the reflections uncensored to simply come uh, is a very, um, a very meditative way of going about writing and journal writing. Uh, it has more to it than simply, you know, yeah. the story of my life uh -huh. kind of thing. Um, writing itself, script, is, can be a very uh, a meditative kind of thing, paying attention to how you're writing. Okay. <laughs> because many of us have to scribble things yeah. off quickly, or, or now we're, we're twittering, well, yeah, oh, and, and now we're doing, <laughs> so that kind of thing is lost. But they used to say, I think it was an old Persian saying it had to do with uh, uh, the um, point of the pen is the point of your mind, okay. uh, and in a sense, seeing that. So writing, and as you say, um, gardening. Some older people really get mm -hmm. into it, and it's, it's as like it's, it's fundamental, it's elemental. They're dealing with the earth. There's the changes of the seasons. It represents this thing of growing, dying, coming around again, it's seasonal. Well, a, all of that's part a big of it. Part, well, that goes along with a big part of your book. You have a lot in here. There's a whole chapter, I think, on time. Mm -hmm. Experiencing time, being in the present is what yeah. a lot of this is about. And I think some of these activities you're talking about allow you to be in the present more than. Very you have a whole big thing in here about time. It's right. very. Um, <laughs> I got. I'm not go back and reread this. It's very sort of philosophical, but it's. No, being you're right about time and the uh, the idea of presence being in the present moment, mm -hmm. because the reality is we are. That's it. Even yeah. our memories are now, yeah. right? There's really, uh, well, and that's, if we're pl our plans for the future are now, yeah, um, and but the problem is we don't think of that because it is you know it's instantaneous. Uh, William James I think called it the, the um, I forget. Well, it's the suspicious present. I mean, it's a okay. suspicious present. Okay. It comes, it goes, and bingo, it's it's not there anymore. Oh. But uh, you probably, some of your readers uh, will probably be aware of a man by the name of Eckhart Tolle wrote a book called, oh, yeah. He's uh, and that's about the power of now. That whole idea being to the extent that you can really be with the present moment mm -hmm. uh, is a powerful tool in terms of, you know. Well, you don't, I think when you're, when you're younger, you're busy sort of living absolutely. your life. You don't know. Um, absolutely. Well, one thing you do, talk about in here, um, you show a little bell curve, and you say that um, as people get older, the, the, the spiritual, and then you can define that any way you want, I guess, the spiritual dimension becomes proportionally more prominent and significant in people's lives as they get older. Is mm -hmm. that what you, does the research show this, or? Uh, well, it's, uh, I, that's, <laughs> that was my own kind of creation, but basically, if you think about how the life cycle goes, mm -hmm. Uh, you start out in the beginning, and an infant doesn't own very much. They don't have an education. Uh, they don't have much in the way of clothing and so on yeah. and so forth. But as we age, we begin to accumulate a whole bunch of things. We, we have first our families, and we accumulate friends, schoolmates, mm -hmm. so on. And all of this builds up until we come to midlife, where probably at that time, most of the time, that's where we're making the most money we make, mm -hmm. that's when our families are perhaps the most full, uh, that's uh, when everything that we think yeah. of, particularly material and social things, are very high. But then what happens, of course, as you start going along the age uh, uh, line, what happens is you begin losing friends because they're dying off. You've moved, they've moved. Mm -hmm. uh, relatives are dying, parents. And pretty soon, all of these things, the social things, and some of the material things, and your body yeah. begins losing some of its resilience and so on <laughs> and so forth. So all of the, think of the social and material things are going down. Yeah. However, there's a part that really has to do with, again, the mind and spirit which remains. It's not dependent upon yeah. your body, necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, or on the, your material things or your social things. And it's that element, which may be very small at the end of this thing, but it's a much larger proportional yeah. part of your life than it used to be. You don't have as many, don't have as much money, as many friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I can't help but asking, um, you're talking about this, um, Jero transcendence and a lot of the research you're talking about 
was not done in the United States. Right. What That's do you th do you think um, some of the conclusions that you've been talking about would would have been the same if they've done these studies in America? No, I think there was. As a matter of fact, they did do studies okay. in America. And that's one of the things I wanted to mention. Uh, there was a man by the name of Ashley, a social psychologist, social gerontologist. And he not only used the same questionnaires and so mm -hmm. on and did oh, right. schedules. There was a little section there, yeah. Uh, but he also used focus groups of, okay. of older people to exchange their ideas and experiences of aging. And what he came up with out of all of those, I had I listed nine things here. What came out of that was number one, finding greater satisfaction in one's inner life. Number two, feeling greater connection to the universe. And this is feeling like you're part of something bigger mm -hmm. that you hadn't really felt about before. And third, having less fear of death. Definitely lower death anxiety and worry. Um, one of the things I think about, you know, when I think about uh, Ingmar Bergman movies, you know, of it's course. not very American in a sense, you know, I don't know if yeah. Americans think that way ordinarily. But uh, so that's why it was, I think these findings were somewhat yeah. suspect. What if we did it on American populations? Well, well, I mean, it, it turns out those central elements stayed the same. They, they can sort of transcend. I mean, I think anyone can watch the Bergman movie, Wild Strawberries. I don't think it matters what country you're from. Absolutely. <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's, yeah, it's very moving. But it's not the kind of thing that I think man in the street or yeah. whatever ordinarily thinks about or thinks in that way. Well, one thing that's very interesting, near the end of your book here, you have this whole little section. Maybe you could talk about this a little bit because I found it really fascinating. You, you talk about here, and I think this is where the thing you just talked about with the, the surveys, the you call symbolic immortality. Well, tell us about that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, you're not familiar with Robert J. Lifton, was a psychiatrist who studied the after effects of the people in uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Now, <clears throat> when people think about mortality, immortality, they figure a number of different ways. Yeah, you have like, is there five ways? Or? Yes, right, there are about five ways. One, of course, is the kind of uh, biological. This would be, I have children, my children are gonna have children, they're gonna be grandchildren, great chan. So the familial line is going to continue, and therefore, in that sense, I have immortality, mm -hmm. okay? And that's a very, very universal one, really. Uh, another one is uh, the, uh, a, a kind of nature one, whereby one sees oneself as part of nature, and that you've gone through the cycle that nature continually goes through, and you identify with you're, that. You're part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then there's the theological. So if you have a religion, whether you're uh, Christian, Islam, uh, or, uh, or Jewish, uh, or any major religion, there's generally something that gives you an afterlife or something similar to that. Uh, so the afterlife, um, depending on how you've lived mm -hmm. your life here, is, is going to be your immortality, if you will. Um, and the one with nature that I said where people identify with nature, unfortunately, the, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki no longer had that. It was obliterated by the atomic bomb. I mean, you, you couldn't even count on nature, nature re, re, renewing itself. So they, what he found was among some of the Japanese survivors was a thing uh, that he called a symbolic uh, uh, transcendence. And it's a, um, where they uh, experience something that takes them out of themselves and out of uh, their bodies. And they, it may have been some experience that moves them into another dimension where these other things really don't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And they've gone beyond that into something larger. It, but it's experiential. They've had some mm -hmm. kind of an epiphany, if you will. Maybe that's moved them into another dimension. And they see that there's something more than what they've been seeing before. And I think you were in the book here, you're on that section. If people score high in two or three or four of these categories, they obviously, I think you were saying they have less fear of death and they're more, they, what they feel like. They oh, have well, more. yeah, this, uh, I, that was the life review thing where they not only uh, have they been reviewing their lives, but they've been uh, taking a look at what the meaning of their life is, okay. for one thing. 
and really taking a look at themselves, positive and negative. Um, and if they uh, have done this, and it's frequently not a happy kind of thing because yeah. some of the regrets and so on they have about what they've done in the past is not very pleasant. But having gone through that process, they uh, do very well when you then test them in terms of their anxiety about dying, uh, much less concern about it because they really work things through. I remember some psychologists being appalled at when they were reviewing uh, in American studies about the only thing people could talk about is uh, uh, who they're going to leave the silverware to when they <laughs> die. And that's about the extent of it. Uh, so. Yes, if people go through that, then they indeed have less fear. Well, I don't know. They said here. I don't know if you're following this, but currently, as we speak, um, we're filming this on December 15th. I think it is. Um, the the New York Times columnist David Brooks, on his blog, or on his column and in, in his blog, he invited people over 70 to write in little essays, and he's been posting them one a day. And it's like a life review process and what they would have, but they're absolutely fascinating. Uh -huh. And he's written a couple of columns on it. I don't know if you're following that or. If you uh, I haven't, no. I don't know. You could take a look at it. Well, then, before we end, this is a, um, who, who would you say your book is for? Because it, it is very sort of philosophical. You do give some examples of how to achieve some of this mindfulness. Who do you think would benefit from reading your book? And this is a library book if people want to come in and check it out, or you can, I think you can get it on Amazon. Who, who would you recommend to read this, other than, you know, everybody, I guess, <laughs> contemplative age? Well, I, I think people who are approaching uh, and going into their 60s and mm -hmm. beyond. Um, you know, there may be people, for example, who uh, feel that um, to turn too much inward, uh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't do that. But they may have an inclination to do it. They might have been introverts all their lives, yeah. but they've been forced to be sociable in, in ways they didn't really want to be. But they might just, if they see that other people do it and can do it, uh, will feel more comfortable with themselves because it's a very natural yeah. kind of development. And it's being, being able to see that other people feel the same way yeah. about it and they can feel more comfortable. Well, it's, it's like you said at the beginning, Americans are always do, do, do. Right. You're, you're, you're coming, doing versus being. You're saying That's we should be, be, be. Right. More being, right. Well, thank you uh, so much. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. So Edmund Sherman, the book is Contemplative Aging, A Way of Being in Later Life. And we'll see you next time on Meet the Author.